See, this is really important right here because I think this speaks in many ways of, in ways in which we problematically are taught to bifurcate our senses, right? Because I always say this, because I always say this whole thing. I say, is it that we have five senses or is it that we've been socially constructed to have five senses, right? And so like this whole thing when you said like all this right here, like it running together, this is good, right? And this is the this is perhaps the important thing, right? Because I think in many ways we get taught this whole idea of how we we're taught to sort of learn, right? And how we're taught to how we need to necessarily teach somebody, right? And what this responsibility means. And perhaps I feel like something one of the things that we we've talked about quite a bit is sort of this whole what is it? I love that line. It's one beautiful line, and there's a lot of beautiful lines in these two, right? I'm just gonna let you know if you have a chance to read their work. But once again, it's always that beautiful inquiry pose, man. When you say, you know, what might it mean to taste sound? What might it mean, you know, what might, you know, what all these and it's like you and you roll through. And it's not to be cute or anything, but to really say that so there's so much more that we're doing when we actually engage in the process of listening. Right, because it's feeling. It is right. It's visual it's visualization, right? And, okay, I know. No, baby, I'm just listening. No, I'm just like <laughs> no, it's, it's really powerful, right? It's really powerful. No, but, no, but when you say that, and I don't know how to convey that to students, because for them, they are. I hear some students say, "She's getting ready to cry. Mm -hmm. She's good." I tell them when I'm teaching black history, you've got to feel it. Yes. And, and I, I don't know what, <laughs> but I know I do so. If I'm telling a story, it's like, if I tear, I, I'm not getting tired because I'm emotional. I'm feeling it. Or I, 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 it my whole body's got to come. So I, when you say that, I thought, I feel history. And I don't know, except that if I read it, I'm having emotional, visual reactions to it. So, in any case, thank you. No, no, no. That's exactly right. Oh, no, no. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. The, Sort of circling back to the enlightenment thing, we think that there are five senses and we think we nailed this. <laughs> right? I just don't remember that like 150 <laughs> years ago, we were pretty sure it was air, fire, water, and what am I missing? Fire. Mm -hmm. yep. Right? And we think, well, that's sort of, we thought that was silly. But if you've ever had anyone do any version of um, Chinese oriented medicines, because they're sort of that's the root. So you get your pulse taken in 14 different places. People will say, like, your yang or your yin is too hard. Take this and drink this tea or move in these kind of spaces. Or, you know, how is it that we suddenly understand acupuncture really works? And it works on a question that what we would have called in a pre enlightenment or current enlightenment time is humorous or these kind of yeah. ephemeral kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of one of the things that all of three of us think about is um, questions of sensorium. So like the way a group or a sets of individuals construct the senses mm -hmm. and how we think about the senses determines how we do things. So they always get sort of filtered through the sociocultural set of screens. But there are places in the world where there are seven senses. There are places where it's like touch and everything else. 
right? There are all these sort of complicated ways that people have decided to, like more than human animals, I guess, have thought about how to construct the ecologies in which they live and how to conceptualize them. And while it can be very helpful to have something to hold on to, when we, when we teach students, we think we should give them the stuff with something to hold on to. We have this sort of pragmatic thing. Mm -hmm. But the problem with pragmatics, pragmatics, I should say, is that sometimes they get in the way of the thing itself or whatever it is you're trying to reach for. And so the question, one of the things we're playing with today and wondering about are questions of structure and improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll get more to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to hear a little more about other people also thought about it. Thank you so much. Like these are mm -hmm. like we couldn't have paid you more to have that sense of thing. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like we we all collapse, or at least I do, and, and everyone does in different ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't write about ontology and epistemology. I don't write about what's being <laughs> <and they don't. laughs> And I don't write about onto hyphen epistemology. Mm -hmm. right? okay. yeah, 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 yeah. I have one word that is like being, knowing, doing. It's just one word because mm -hmm. your isness determines your knowledge, and all of these are actions, right? Mm -hmm. And so, if we collapse these things, what does it do for how we understand the world? What does it do for a whole person? What does it do when we're teaching people? What does it do for teaching young people? How do we adapt to violence? And all these kind of questions that we're thinking about. But what what were some of the other things you thought and, and felt and heard? As you guys are talking, I, I can't help but think of autism. And so mm -hmm. at the root of it, it's about how sensory information is received, how it's perceived, and then the reaction to it sometimes, mm -hmm. which is a disability, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. medically, like uh, psychologically, mm -hmm. uh, culturally speaking. Um, there's a right way that quote unquote normal people do it, and then <laughs> there's the abnormal way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of a lot more current research is looking about how um, sensory conditions, um, how you know they can be, how beneficial they can be just in daily life and in employment and school. Mm -hmm. If we kind of reframe the way that these conditions, you know, mm -hmm. how, looking at them as strengths instead of weaknesses, you know, it's about the setting and about the culture, it's about the time and the space, and celebrating how being different can actually be a great thing. Yeah. Um, so that's what I thought as we were all talking about before that, as I was watching you, I was kind of, I felt like I was getting an insight into what you were feeling. Um, and just even going back to the, the concept of closing your eyes, I, I noticed that both of you did that a lot. And so I just felt like you were talking to us in another language and mm -hmm. I can't necessarily interpret it, but I felt it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Was there more? Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Um, one I, feel, I just feel something back there. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, it's real. It's real. But I'm really kidding. I mean, it sort of was a very relaxing feeling. And it's after lunch. Smooth jazz. Anything but smooth jazz. I think I, I worried actually, and it's funny because I asked you here, mm -hmm. and I knew what, that there was going to be music involved. And at the same time, in educational contexts, I I find myself slipping into this concern about what kind of noise or what kind of sounds mm -hmm. are acceptable, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And there were moments in my head I was like, oh, we should have seen, you know, if we could have gotten the lecture hall or something mm -hmm. that is in a different space as to not interrupt. And then I think about, on one hand, sharing sound space and what that is. That's something mm -hmm. I talk to my children a lot, quite a bit. Um, and then what it means to have sounds that are not typical for this space. Mm -hmm. And then like this weird worry, like, oh, they'll hear us. <laughs> Who's they? I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, like, instead, it, like to... I'm sorry, did I stop? No, baby. <laughs> but I but I'm thinking about this, yes. Like, I mean, like it's always like it's also that weird binary because once again, what gets considered who what have, what does it mean to really talk about ideas of noise versus mm -hmm. music, right? In this sense, right? Yeah. Right? And so what does it mean? To, and also how do you necessarily map the notion of what is a noise body? Right. Now once again, that becomes a, that becomes what? Very much a racial racialized discourse, 
right? That becomes very much a neurotypical dis discourse, right? That becomes a gender discourse, that, right? That becomes a sexual identity. <laughs> it's also, normalizing the crime. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, and so these things, so these things are really, really quite important, right? Of how that once again, how this gets opened up, right? I think these, and also I think these things once again, when we talk about knowledge, what are the ways? What are some ways that we say that people say knowledge is legitimized? Mm -hmm. Now you don't have to agree with it. But if you were to observe, what are the ways in which knowledge is legitimized? Right. What would some, be some things that you would say? Because this is always an important thing that I, I, that we that we always sit in our back. That feel so? <laughs> <laughs> I tend to emphasize this is that I felt this is being rather culture, the bank used to have knowledge to legitimize. You may not be able to document what you think, but you've got to support it. Mm -hmm. By documenting it, so it's it's the notion that it can be that when you said the noise, I just want to go back to that because I was and maybe somebody here know I don't know if it was an artist or someone who wrote the book if it's something the book uh, because when you said that but who wrote the book or who wrote the song track bring the noise mm -hmm. oh yeah. but I could so I'm sorry I heard you talking mm -hmm. but I kept hearing bring the noise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I know it, it became one of those things because you're right mm -hmm. the notion that certain people make noise mm -hmm. or the certain you know, the certain stuff we consider noise mm -hmm. as opposed to melody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh in any case but I just kind of went through this but you're right, and it is so cultural bad because I can be talking to somebody. This happened at the DMV, mm -hmm. and I said, "Gosh, I'm not angry. Now I'm getting angry." You first thing you to me and say, "Calm down." Right. Calm down, to me. Right. And I said, you know, <laughs> "Angry." It is my culture. I bring my whole body to a conversation. I do my hands work, mm -hmm. my head work, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm having a conversation, nothing gets delayed either. Mm -hmm. It's a cultural thing. It's not because I'm angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. when you when you say, but yeah, this, it just goes beyond that. We just uh, what we consider different. You said, what is legit? Uh, if you're going to hold a conversation, you have to hold it in a culturally uh, well, right. All right. <laughs> yeah, responsible, respectful way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some more? No, that's it. When you, so I, I don't have anything. When you said what legitimate, yet I require that kind of standard European document before you, so that you can mm -hmm. base it on something. But ways of knowing is important. Yeah. I um, think, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, you asked how is knowledge legitimized? When <laughs> it's legitimized. In our American schooling and standardized tests or a yeah. on a paper, and true educators know that that's that's not the only way. That mm -hmm. it, could, it could be one way, but it is not the only way, or even the best way mm -hmm. to legitimize knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right? Knowledge can be shared in many fashions, and usually pencil and paper is the most restrictive way mm -hmm. to share knowledge. Yes. And I also think too noise. Like I, I work in elementary edu you know, sphere, and noise in the way people perceive noise in a classroom is often it should be quiet. <laughs> and I say if it's quiet in a kindergarten or an elementary classroom, then learning is not occurring, right? So noise is a very powerful thing because noise means engagement, and so and there is a difference culturally in what noise looks like and sounds like in different spaces too and, and how that needs to be respected across the lines. Absolutely. So the kid are gonna bring the noise. Bring the noise. Bring, the noise. bring the noise. If it's quiet something's going on that can right. be going on noise. Forgive me for I'm not taking I'm taking notes. So I don't forget I'm exhausted and I <laughs> I usually take them but I'm I'm even more quiet than usual which is not good. But I'm going to circle back around to a couple points raised to sort of think about them through for a minute, mm -hmm. uh, just to respond. And the first is this notion of normalcy, what is normal, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite stories about normalcy is that Martha's life, Martha's Vineyard, that that is now, used to have, used to be sort of just a place where people lived and had a very large deaf community. They had a very large deaf, deaf community. community. And everyone on, on the island signed. Mm -hmm. There was no deafness as we understand what deafness is. And then the construction of deafness itself is another thing, 
right? So if everyone, there's there's deafness there. I don't want to really sort of get in too much to it, but questions of like deaf gain, just hearing loss, like there are all these other ways we can conceptualize the world. But this notion that um, there's a norm and deviation from the norm is the issue is a very human way to be. And so in our roles as educators, it's it's not just that someone is neurodiverse. Everybody is neurodiverse. It's not that someone, sorry, everybody. everyone is neurodiverse. Everyone, okay. like how I'm thinking is not how all of you are thinking. In the same way, how I'm hearing is not how all you're hearing. It's filtered through my body, through sociocultural norms and values, through all these sets of understandings, right? And so as we negotiate through all of those questions, when they when they come together, they form structures, right? And we think about noise versus noise and stillness, right? We think about those in the classrooms. But really what that means is we want people. I, I wrote two different things about policing deafness and about policing students. And one of the things I was thinking about it is that we want deaf kids to act like hearing kids. We want hearing kids to act like they're deaf to everybody but the teacher, right? If we want to use these words in a sort of gross kind of way. And I want to be very clear about the complexity and possibilities of deaf culture and literature, which we don't pay enough attention to. Um, best, I don't think, exists. So the language that we use in public education now that came alive in the 90s when we needed to professionalize the field came from business. Mm -hmm. Every single thing we care mm -hmm. about in education mm -hmm. came either from eugenics. Okay, so here are eugenics thoughts. Measurable goals and objectives. That's eugenicist. Uh, lesson plans. Yes, scientific curriculum. All of those are Franklin Bobbitt and eight years before he wrote the curriculum, before then curriculum was a racetrack. Which became a race with the name of the curriculum, right? Before that, he wrote a paper called Practical Eugenics, in which he laid out his case in one of the main journals of psychology that still exists today. And then nine years later, he puts it into practice. So if you notice a lot of talk about what we're teaching is not about the subject or how we carry ourselves, it's about sets of practices that allow you not to pay attention to those things as you as you do them. Um, so thinking about what's best and how those things are important. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. And then um, argument versus narrative versus being, right? So there are all those sort of complications because who we are um, is socioculturally determined. So, for example, I grew up in a place where everyone talks over everybody. <laughs> Every, so I grew up in a, a, a Jewish home in the 70s in Washington, D.C. So my life was primarily uh, Black. A little bit Jewish of the home, but not necessarily outside of it. And like lots of different people from sort of different ethnicities and lots of people from different parts of the world who came in for different reasons. Um, and so when I moved to the Midwest after being, and being from East Coast to West Coast was one thing, but moving in the Midwest, people are like, oh, you're a hand talk. And they want, they're like, I can't understand you if you're gesturing. <laughs> and I was like, and I can't understand you unless I do this, right? And so the way people will try and put things together for you are sets of ideas that we have that form structures, which will be sort of what we're sort of getting at a little bit later. But in terms of the ethics and affect and all those kind of things, um, they're central to what we do. And the one of the important things that uh, Reagan talks about, and in terms of ethics, and one of the things that I think is important for us to remember about ethics, is ethics is not not just what you do, it's the line about what you want. So it's not just what you'll do. Like you, you should act in an ethical way. You sort of think you should do those kind of things, right? But it's also the line which, against which you will not do things. And we spend a lot more time talking about how to behave and sort of sculpting that almost to a policing or, or uh, renorming of the norm of what that means than we do to just letting it be. And, and these kind of things are very difficult to negotiate um, in real time with students and with others, right? Like, and we, we fall into these kinds of traps. And they're very hard to do. So one of the things we need to think about, like we talk about boundaries now. And that's cool. I'm down for talking about boundaries. But we're also talking about what is the limit of okay? And it's in the enforcement of the limiting that okay is we the educators. That's where we do the most harm. Right? So if everything's always misheard, what's coming out of my mouth is not what you're hearing. And if everything's already sort of constructed, then one person's noise is another person's pleasure. Right? Mm -hmm. And so watching how people employ it is much more important than what, how to define it in these kind of things. 
And I'm hearing that sort of in a lot of the kind of talk. Yeah, well, I'm, can I, like, oh, can, can I answer that? Because yeah, yeah. I think there's something really powerful also, like, you talk about, how to, like, unpacking that, but all the boundaries, but also unpacking agency, right? I'm because I'm like, unpacking agency. Okay. Right? And I think that there's a really problematic way in how I've witnessed people talk about agency, right? Because they talk about it as, I'm going to give you the agency right now to play the horn. I'm right, going right. to give you the agency. I'm going to teach you something. It's not apparent. Yeah. Well, rather than talking about, like, you don't give or take agents, right? And I think that there's something really powerful when we talk about boundaries, right? I think agency, even, even further, when we talk about notions of agents, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in many ways, like, it, what we're doing is not to say, ha, 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 look at what we can do in front of people, but it's about more so saying, like, what are these points? What, in many ways, this is very much a way to really talk about the ways in which we witness each other's agency in the brand, right? And how do we necessarily honor that? And really, how does that become? And I don't want to say metaphor, but how does that necessarily? What are the ways that we re-embody that every day, right? Like if we're really like in in it, right? Really mm -hmm. present. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean to really deal with the agency? And we have acknowledge honor in different ways, right? And I think that's a really powerful thing, especially when we unpack boundaries. I think in many ways that goes back to the question of knowledge and how we legitimize legitimize knowledge, right? I think that is a very problematic notion of very rigid, violent sets of how we think somebody gives gets or gives is given agents, right? I think that there's something very powerful about why is it that we need to necessarily feel that we should be able to explain what we think. Right. And I think this becomes a really problematic thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, for, so I think about this particularly when we think about Von de Warrior, right? Think about Von de Warrior, indigenous, uh, indigenous right. philosopher, uh, indigenous philosopher, lawyer, theologian, right? And what does he say? He says, look, as a Native person, I know that the Black Hills are important and they are a source of medicine and healing. Now, I can't explain that. But that's not the important thing, right? So I think it becomes this whole thing of what is it that we prioritize, right? When we talk about the process of learning, right? I'm not necessarily saying anything new, and we're not saying anything completely new, but what we're saying is really, what does it really come mean to come and have this have this conversation publicly and be able to be sustained and sort of have that sort of ignited as a way to sort of maybe turn our improvis improvisatory responsibilities in this process of learning. Exactly. Speaking of uh, ethics and learning, it's past two o'clock. We have a double session. So if you want to stay, we, we would love to have you. Is, the session ends at two? Yeah, I think we'll so. Yeah. And so we'll be here and we'll, we'll also tell probably us. unpack it. But if you don't end up staying, the answer is we kind of had an idea what we were doing. We didn't rehearse any of that. Every change and everything that happened happened exactly in that moment. So wait, I missed it. You did? You did. Do, are you able to like musically kind of well, communicate with each other? Is it like we had a feel from each other? We had a plan. Improv? <laughs> well, we had a plan, but immediately we didn't do it. Yeah. And then about halfway through, so what we were going to do was like play one song, like we had a game out of it. We were going to play like a song that looked like it was more freely improvised and play freely improvised and look kind of structure a little mm -hmm. bit to some degree. Mm -hmm. But it probably wasn't, and to some degree, there was a bit of planning in the structure because we both had this conversation of this tune in our heads and the chord structure went there. Um, so when Reagan quoted the tune at one point, he and I sort of ghosted through it a little bit and then back out. But we did discuss what harmonies we would take, we did discuss what pieces would go, like all the things that sounded what seemed like they stopped and started on cue. And when we ended, those are all just listing the time. Mm -hmm. So the second session is going to be about like what does it mean to listen and how to do these things. And if you can't make it, I think the thing we'd like you to walk away from that all of this is is an inversion of how we think, which is we don't think that there's structures from which you improvise. We think that you're constantly improvising structures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And if improvisation is everything from like how you draw a bow across a piece, like yo-yo ma's. Uh, we go to we go to hear him play solo cello pieces, whether it's Bach or someone else, because of his particular way of addressing the instrument and doing it in front of the palm. What he plays is not really what's on the page. And even when people are playing an orchestral thing together, 
the differences with which they enunciate things makes a difference, right? And they combine to agree to make a structure. And so when kids are off task, they can't be else. What that does for learning and listening is, what do you hear? What's going on right now? Not get back onto what I said. But what is the knowledge you're experiencing? And how can we think about that together? Right? Because if you're a skilled educator, you should be able to take a child's positionality and understanding and build something around it in the moment. We call them teachable moments, right? When do those happen? Can we plan them? Like, so everything we have from discovery and, and research to how we teach are these sort of emergent sets of understandings that we pretend are structures that we know. And if you have a lesson plan that goes as it was written, you didn't teach well. Right? So there are all these kind of important things that you need to remember. But like, yeah. the, the, uh, just one more piece Please. too, because I mean, you, you yeah, 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 sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. And it was, and it's still almost like a jam session because with my eyes closed and listening to you, what I didn't detect was discord. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. So everything, and I could have been imagination, <laughs> but it sounded, I could tell you all were both doing your own thing, but whatever that own thing was, it had a sense of harmony to it. Mm -hmm. wow. okay, so, I mean, that, to me, that's what a jam said. So I heard you say, you know, you can't do it because then everybody's trying to... Well, if I, came out, if I came out and played super freely in the middle of a jam session, <laughs> depending on the crowd, depending on the space, mm -hmm. like if everyone's going to be playing yeah, standards no, and playing it's... changes, that wouldn't be a thing. Or it was a jam session where people just trying to get a certain kind of groove and feeling on, and they didn't understand this kind of thing as participating in that, which is about structures and relationality. Well, I mean, I think the other part was, I mean, I think what you do feel, and I mean, it's like, you know, I think about it like when you like walk into a family, like you could say like, oh, they are family. Whether they are blood or chosen, they are family. Like you see a crowd of people and like, they're family, right? I think one of, one of the things that, is felt and it's partly was how long have we been together? Um, I mean, 20, 2010, 2010, maybe, maybe in 2011. Yeah, maybe something like close to close to 15 years. Yeah, so it's like that's so part of that is also in a way sort of they're just being together yeah. and just constantly communicating with each other all the time. Like I think about this all the time, especially. Like it makes sense in many ways with these types of relationships, especially now when I'm and especially when I go back and read like about Duke Ellington and, and Billy Strayhorn, right? Because Duke Ellington and Baby and it was it was recorded so many times where Billy Strayhorn or will walk into the office where Duke Ellington was getting, you know, getting ready for a show, and they would just look at each other and Strayhorn would just be like, Okay, on it. You know, yeah. and then go from there. So I think that, you know, there's like rich ways in how you, in any relationship of how you develop, you know, develop different ways of communication. And sometimes they, and they come out in different ways. And maybe that's part of, I think that's part of what you see. I'm you seeing know? Bruce Springsteen tomorrow. And I think that's what his, like, he's the oh, kind of one, right? Well, they, I mean, they just can kind of feel and start playing and get that. I mean, I'm not a huge Bruce Springsteen fan, but that's we're going to the concert simply because mm -hmm. I, my husband and son are very into music and they're like, it's such an experience to watch this group of people just play together and how they experience the music together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question in regard to education about this? Yeah, that's what that's trying to do. <laughs> so I... I don't know a lot of the backstory with um, one of the adjuncts that we had that worked with our students in, in art. We had an art. I, I don't know the person. I don't even know. But I, when, when you're talking about your art, I think it's so important that our teachers or next generation of teachers have an understanding and appreciation for the arts, especially as it gets cut continues is always not not a new thing to get mm -hmm. cut from our you know lower funded schools but to make sure that our teachers have an appreciation for this right. what would you when my students are coming to me saying i don't give a rasputuity about art mm -hmm. i can't draw a picture don't care about it can't play an instrument mm -hmm. what does that have to do with me being a third grade teacher mm -hmm. 
I also can't play an instrument or draw a straight line, right? So I have that same thing, but yet I have such an appreciation for this as, as a form of education, as a form of expression, as a form of building community. Give me some advice. Give me something to say to those. Two questions. Early childhood and elementary primarily? Yeah. And is it primary like three and down? Is it like K through three? It's pre-K to four. Pre-K to four. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can't really kind of remember. I work in Jersey and live in Philadelphia. I can remember who has which. Yeah, I wish we still had pre K six, but it's pre K four. It's all the same, you know. But it's it's. I think there's just all that separate. You know, the art teacher does it, the music teacher does it. It doesn't have any space, yeah. and and I want to convey the need for the space, but I don't know the language or ways in which to convey that message. I I think about it Socratically, kind of like. So please, exp oh, okay, that's cool. So you don't listen to music or or positively. So what's your favorite kind of music? Mm -hmm. What do you listen to when you get sad? Or what do you listen to that helps you through a talk talk? Or what do you like to feel? Or what television do you like to watch? Because all of these are art forms, right? Mm -hmm. And just getting them to sort of name all, like what, okay, art's not important. I heard you. When you have free time, what do you do? And where do you go? And what are the things happening there? So if you go to a friend's house and you're hanging out, Sort of like people go to do things together, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of those things have artistic or aesthetic components. So, one of the things that the arts do is they make explicit our, in Western sense, often internal sets of understandings about how we are and what we feel. And that's super significant. There's also the thing for people who are really uh, procedurally oriented. Where you can say, like, okay, so let me get this straight. Do you like math? So what's the difference between math and drawing, please? Why is one more important than the other? What happens if you're a kid who's the thing that they can do and the most interested in expression is drawing? Right? For the littles, it's super important, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's the other thing that when I work in elementary schools or work in an elementary school, work with elementary school teachers. People would say, like, well, like, look, if you go to a kindergarten group and you say, everybody stand up, everyone stand up. Like, you can get a, like, I, I show students that you can, as an educator, you get people to do stuff. Mm -hmm. So often you're like, surprise, Simon says. Like, I'll just stand up in the middle of the left and go, so I'll stand up and be like, Simon says, put your hand on your head. And we're looking at me and be like, Simon says. <laughs> but, and people do it immediately, right? So there, there's that kind of understanding. Um, but I, I think that something just to, to tell people about how they are is it, if you go into a kindergarten classroom and you say, today we're going to talk about dance, half the kids are going to start talking about dancing, right? And you, you have to, and by third grade, they won't. So part of the answer is we're teaching it out of them. Is that what you'd like? Mm -hmm. Human beings come out relating in this way, mm -hmm. right? Like watching young children have conversations about race, like three, four-year-olds. Half the time it's, look at that, That's mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? You're so, I've never seen. I've never seen that, right? Or oftentimes when I work with young children in um, majority African American spaces, because I, I have I'm hairy arms, and so I will inevitably have a child, and they won't know they're doing it while we're looking at the computer talking. They'll just be rubbing my arm, <laughs> and they won't they won't notice that they're doing it. I don't want to embarrass them, but the tactile sensation of being is something that's new and different, but also positive. This is human experience, and so why as an educator do you want to be involved in limiting people? Why as an educator do you want to be involved in learning forms of expression? <laughs> right? Why as an educator do you want to play like, and it's a choice. Yeah. Do you want to be one of the people who keeps limiting people from who they could be? Or not? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that happens is I, I don't think music is a language. I mean that group. I think music is a form of expression, possibly communication. And it can be made linguistic. Like we have sets of language we use that are signals for how we work. But it doesn't have to, right? And the arts get at the things you can't name. They get it and they show us who we are. And the reason that they shut down professors and artists first in the new revolution, and, or use them either way, mm -hmm. is because you don't want people teaching people that they can think outside and imagine otherwise. Or as Du Bois said in 28, I don't care if one side uh, he, he's like, I don't care. I don't give a wit for any art that's not political. So an art and by political I'm then, yeah, yeah, but he used the word propaganda. It was new in 1928. It was 1928, by the way. 
He's like, but I do care when one side is allowed and the other is stripped and silent. So if you can't imagine yourself in a future space, you cannot be anything else that you are. And the arts allow you to imagine yourself otherwise, which is core of the base of people you can be. Right? Question yeah. to you. You said you don't think music is its own language. Yeah. Okay. yeah Trump. <laughs> if the drums were used to communicate in Africa, isn't that a language? It's even deeper than that. Because as I say it, I'm a person who plays some traditional folklore instruments in which if you're in a place and someone's talking, the, the elder on the mother drum silence you by playing rhythm that tells you to be quiet. So I'm not saying music cannot become a language, but I'm saying it's not necessarily a language. That is a set of ways of understanding when it's codified and put into a place where it is linguistic and understanding. It's true for Carnatic music and it's with all classical music in India and all these other spaces, other non-Western, et cetera, right? But in all these spaces, in these knowledge systems, including indigenous knowledge systems, they do have a question of language and convey thought. But it does not have to. That's what we do with it. And so we're, it's like this, all the sort of post, uh, all the, the sort of new material sense of understanding. We'll talk about a forest. And there's a book that's kind of wonderful by an indigenous scholar, it's brilliant, called How Forests Think. But my problem with that book is not that I think the ideas are wrong. It's that I don't think forests think. I think forests do something remarkable that we can't comprehend. And to put the human nature of thinking on it is an error twice. Because it brings in a Western notion of what, what value it is it things. And because it's thinking, you have to be wrong. That's content. That's enlightenment thought. As opposed to... There are communications and things that happen in forests that we will be lucky enough to understand how to understand and express those things. And they may be forms of communication, but they're not necessarily language. The thing about language is it gets codified in particular ways, and then those things sort of become how we do it. And then we're sort of back in the space where we started. And so for me, thinking about music as forms of communication and expression, as opposed to linguistic understandings, is significant because you can communicate like this, like so. Um, so, for example, I used to live in rural Japan, and people will invite you to stuff all the time because it's socio culturally correct for someone to offer you something as a guest. Oh, you should come over, we should go do these things. But it's just an artifice, they don't mean it. And so, there's a lot of misinterpretation between Westerners. Japanese folk, where Japanese people are like, I've got this wander at my house, I'm feeding this guy. He doesn't seem to be thanking me enough. He didn't understand I wasn't really asking over. And then we said, okay, I was now in a sociocultural position where it wasn't refused, right? And so there are a lot of these sort of cross-cultural understandings about how language and things function. Um, and so I, I find it helpful you know, to think about it as modes of connection, possibly communication, possibly expression. But I think we already always miss here which means I think us understanding each other at all is miracle. Right? And so, and I, I hear you on language. Like, I, I understand I'm speaking for and against the point, but there's a, a neither nor. It is neither language nor not language. Sort of how I feel about it. Well, how can I argue that point? <laughs> Faces, you know. Right? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, right. I mean, because... The, the, so in terms of a lot of the West African things that came through a lot of different knowledge systems that became ways we live in, they are all linguistically related, like related to songs, or related to patterns, or related to understanding, right? And they're also related to letting people know who's in and out of it. They're all those kinds of things, right? So some of the warm-ups I play to get myself used to things are some different versions of that on drums. And as a young person, I would do it to show people what I do. Mm -hmm. And as a mature, mature-er, that's all. I use them to get my body ready for what I need to do. It's what allows me to get into a space. And so those are like, what is the linguistic function of that? And those are the sort of nuances and complications. But I take the point. Are you, are you going to say something about that? I was just circling back to the root of this um, discourse that we had, which was, what do you say to somebody that's like, Care of art. Mm. It's hard for me to 
not show my disdain for the question. And I had no artistic history or background or connection, but I think as a more, as I mature now that I'm a mother, and I think Walter, I shared this with you, I have a, a son who struggled, struggled all through elementary school, played the snare drum, you know, in the school little band, mm -hmm. and it was music and getting more involved with music. Um, he was an athlete, I thought that was, once he found music and he became a drummer, mm. the way that he was able to express himself through his music, because he never had the words to express himself. Look, I'm getting yeah. goosebumps because it's so emotional to me. Like the drums literally saved my kid. You know, the School of Rock in Fort Washington, PA saved my kid. I spent thousands on therapists. Right. It was playing the drums because he was able to just this is how I feel. This is what's going on for me. And he uses music. He writes songs now. He's taught himself mm -hmm. to play the guitar, both bass and, I guess, I don't know, my instruments, the other one, electric guitar, I don't know. <laughs> you know, he's, that has been, so like Walter, when you're saying expression, that is how good, <clears throat> bad mood, bored, you know, whatever he's feeling, he'll pick up whatever instrument kind of goes with that. So when I heard my students complaining, you know, this is so stupid. We're taking this dumb art class and I don't know how to make baskets and whatever. I found myself frustrated because I'm like, don't want to go through the speech I just gave with the students. But I'm like, oh my goodness, but you, you know, art is the actual creating something really could be a great way for a student to let you as the teacher know something that maybe they don't have the words for. But I didn't handle it well because I was annoyed by the question. I thought it was a stupid question and I let that be known that I thought it was a stupid yeah, question, yeah. <laughs> which I shouldn't have done, but you know, I was more I frustrated. Sure. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta say that. <laughs> I mean, but you know, I always, but one of the things, I think the broader inquiry is always like the, um, I had to put on my syllabi. I say very directly. I say like, well, I don't see so much so far, but I say sometimes, I say like, I feel like that y'all, many of y'all have been taught the education is, you know, doing well on the test, mm -hmm. making a good grade. <laughs> and I think that some of y'all were considered great students because you did that, and some of you were considered bad students. Because you went to that, right? But I want to, but I want to put this in your head. Where is the line between deep education and indoctrination, mm -hmm. right? Because I think you start asking that, you start asking that question, and it becomes a it, the one thing that I'm always trying to get people to get into is is the 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 locus of learning is not up here. It's actually this really incredible community. Of learners, mm -hmm. and how they, and how we're cultivating different kinds of learning, which is that if that is the space, right? Mm -hmm. And in many in many ways, I do say this does have this does have to be a creative endeavor, right? This is why I always talk about improvisational responsibility, right? Because we have a responsibility to be engaged in that deep inquiry, right? So it becomes that. It also becomes the question of is about is the art or the art of. Right, because I teach at an arts, I teach at an arts conservatory. Mm -hmm. Right, I think sometimes I think one of the problems. <laughs> I think one of the questions I often have to poach <laughs> or present is, is this art that you're doing, or are you doing this because this is how you've been indoctrinated and how to engage with what you consider though, mm -hmm. and this is important right there. That you had, you had, so it's like. You really have to unpack that for yourself. So one of the things that I do say is because people, because sometimes people just think like, oh my gosh, you've just read everything, you've just done everything. But it's like, I read a lot, but part of that is is out of curiosity, right? Right. And I think that the curiosity right there, that is a deeply Art, artistic existence, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that from I'm saying that from any standpoint, right? So whether I'm picking up this horn, or whether I'm sitting, or whether I speak to an engineer, I'm like, wow, you know. So a lot of it. So for me, a lot of times it has to be 
it has the it has the, I almost I have to take I have to step to the side and almost create a parallel channel mm. and say like mm. I want you to think about this though right mm. or and I and even so like there's a point where it's because it's like let me tell you is when I get excited about something I take a deep dive right I go very deep right I'm always interested in the things I'm always interested in is I'm always interested in what. I'm interested. I think more than anything, I think, and I was, t- I was telling, I think I've told you this, I might have told you this. I think I'm more interested in process. Not in linear. Process? Yes. Not, li- not in a, procedure, but process. Yes. And, and not in a linear sense, right? So it's like, for me, like, when I say that, I'm saying, like, I love Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, right? But mm-hmm. what I do realize is that it took Ralph Ellison how many years to write that? 12 years, right? I was just looking at, uh, I was just looking at, a documentary with Ellison about 35 minutes and he was reading excerpts uh, he was reading excerpts from a sermon that he had written in this book right they never got released right so I'm always fascinated by the process of how one gets to doing something right so well, sometimes it, it becomes a really fascinating way to sort of open up like and you talk about these people and what were their process and how actually the process becomes really a very, very fascinating story within this narrative within itself to kind of, that helps them almost be like, oh, I guess people do yeah. actually engage very deeply in different in different ways to sort of create what I would say the art of, mm-hmm. the product, the art of, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the thing about difference is deficit makes it so awful. Yeah. This difference is the easiest thing to find between two characters. That's the lowest hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of things I wanted to think about. Uh, one is the education versus schooling, just to <laughs> sort of get that split clear. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like knowledge systems versus versus uh, curriculum. Like those can be the same, or they or they cannot, depending on how what your definition is. Currently, we have all three have very broad definitions of curriculum, and also multiple balance. Um, in terms of relationships, I, I ended up saying this, and some of you want me to write it, but um, the longest relationships I've had in my entire life are in the order of this. My parents, my siblings, my dad's saxophone, and this saxophone. Mm-hmm. I've been playing my dad's horn since I was 10, or 53. Mm-hmm. And this horn, I've been playing since I was 21. And this one and I are the same age, but we're in the same year, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. And so you end up, and it's it's a beast. I mean, Sonny Rollins has a wonderful thing where he's like, in, in this uh, one documentary, he says, look, you know, you play a lot, but, and you try and see, it. sometimes you win, sometimes the horn wins, but the horn wins most of the time, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're practicing to try and, the frustration is not, the, the reason for technique, the reason for technique is for the expression of the art. What we're teaching children in school should be for knowledge and the expression of understandings and the ways that we can do these things in other ways, we communicate with them, think with them, doing the world with them, etc. The purpose of it is not to achieve a preset set of things. So it's simple to establish in order that we might. And we know this because in the standardized world we live in, we say John Dewey, we say Maria Montessori, we say Reggie Amelia, and all of them had different sort of sets of structures. But the fundamental thing that they share is that educator should be the person who listens to the child and from that space builds understandings of what they can do, not the inverse. That's what indigenous knowledge is saying. That's what a lot of non-Western sets of understanding is saying, right? Which is not to say you're not being indoctrinated. Like I'm, I'm heavily indoctrinated, right? I went to all schooling and I was literally indoctrinated to get indoctrinated, right? And so, there's that tension as well, right? Because that's why the ethics matter so much. Because we're trying to show people ways of being and knowing and doing that they are they're they're in the world with that in ways that are going to you're gonna cause harm, especially as an educator. Like you can't not cause harm. We're people, we make mistakes, we do all kinds of things. So the notion that we're not we're gonna go to classroom, we're not gonna hurt anybody is silly. It's as silly as all the kindergartners call each other friends, right? They're not friends. I kid just hit the other kid in the head with a the phone. Mm-hmm. These are not friends, right? <laughs> but but they're <laughs> how we're not um, And then one of the things I want to sort of go back to are two things. Uh, one, 
to the original point about how we sounded in terms of what we do. Reagan and I, like the three of us really love each other. And we also, Reagan and I have oddly very similar sensibilities for the slight age gap between us. Like even in the car on the way over talking about what records we like and the rest of it is constantly shocking. Or I'll be like, I never heard that's what I was listening to, like me too. Like these sort of waves of things that happen. You know, and, you know, we don't talk for a few weeks or a couple months that happens. And we both like harmony and we both like distance. So we're both really, so the things that might otherwise be distant. Like if you heard a chord structure of what we were doing, in a Western sense, on the instruments we're using while we're trying to push past the limitations of those instruments, they would be considered to be quote unquote distant. Mm -hmm. But because we approach them in the same way, <coughs> with a certain combined set of care and listening, it sounds harmonious, even when it is deeply discordant. And that's also, I think, part of what gets missed is it's not just sociocultural, it's how people relate. And how the room feels like we couldn't have played like that if the room didn't feel right because it's yeah. um and then the last thing yeah. I, did, I just want to yeah, yeah please you made me think of something honestly that i haven't thought of in years mm -hmm. if not decades mm -hmm. when you yeah. said it's just the way we i remember reading long time ago i think it was in a book but it could have been on a card mm -hmm. i don't remember anymore that's how long yeah. But it said the ways in which we differ the most is also the ways in which we fit together most profoundly. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't tell That's why I thought, oh, oh she, uh, <laughs> that's so good. That's so good. <laughs> and that's so good. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, uh, or the friend told me, but in any case, these. Yeah. When I carried it along these this long, let me know so I can feel the thing like this goes in. Forgive me not. Yeah, yeah. So when you when you, you were talking, so what sounds like like harmony just to, it well to us sound like playing harmony. Immediately, I thought of the ways in which we differ the most. Yeah. Or the, it's actually dissonance, but for but it, it is so profound until it comes off as harmony. Right. Mm -hmm. But that what that's right. what harmony is, though, isn't mm -hmm. it? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's that's part of the constructive nature. This is the language to meet in, right? Mm -hmm. Because dissonance and harmony are both sociocultural constructions. Mm -hmm. So if you go listen to Peking opera, uh, uh, Carnactic music, and um, like Bach, and I, I don't know, a, a Cholo in Brazil or something, mm -hmm. all of those things have their internal logics. But the question is what's harmonious and not is different in each one of those. The question of what counts as dissonance is different than the of others. And so these are socioculturally constructed. So if it's socioculturally in music, it's also socioculturally constructed in, in, in education and ecology, right? So what people perceive as dissonance or what people perceive as those things can, can be taken apart and thought of in other ways because it's what allows us to get at those spaces. Which is why, like, and it seems worried about friction, but also in a different way. Because frictions, while they exist, can be quite generative. The question is what they generate. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so part of what I, I in regular my conversations about this over the years, we both like the, we both like the risk of it, but we also both like the love and the risk. Of it, right? And that's, that's one of the things that we wanted everyone to sort of take away from today is that the move from talking to listen, even though this format doesn't really do that right now, deeply significant. What does it mean to listen to um, Lucy Garelli writes, um, how am I to listen to you? And I just love that. It's picked up with so many of his tongue work, but I think Audrey was right there, but, but that kind of stuff. We're gonna, we'll be back. Yeah. We're gonna, the session ends in four minutes, just so you know. All right. Do it quick. So, I mean, because we're going to end soon. Do you guys want to, do the two of you want to play some things? Can we call, I it, just see this, can I see the shell? Which one? Oh, Grab there's it. There's more than one. I'm actually modeling it. There's a ring to it. But I want it to be sort of dead. So this. Uh, yeah, and then there's wraps, columns, and then. But you can say. So you, you just the finger, you're not using. I'm not. In that case, that's fine. But in this case, I'm just pressing with my heel in, and basically, right. <laughs> and so once you get the hang of what to do, then you can do it. But it takes 
Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like all of these things, like learning how to play these well took two years. Really? Yeah. Because because you have to plan. You have to know when to plan. You have to be comfortable playing. And then they have to do the thing you want them to do. Which is not sad. Like, oh, we're not on stop. But it was for a while before I would just show up. Like, so my gig bag, when I gig on bar, was just a stop. That's it. It's a very small bag. Um, Can you guys read music? Can you? Okay. Because a lot of times I'm always fascinated by the fact that some talented musicians really can't, don't, read, can't read music. Read music. Yeah. yeah, like I, I mean, so there's a young man in my son's uh, band, phenomenal guitarist. Yeah. Doesn't know how to read music, but yet you can give him, he can listen to just about anything and literally play. That's good. Well, it, that was like the question of like, how do one of these ways do we problematically legitimize knowledge? No, right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about well, our whole system is set up around that because even higher ed, you know, yeah. you know, if you have a doctor, that must mean you're the most knowledgeable person. Yeah, exactly. An expert. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. People, I could sit there here and listen to you. Yeah. Well, I know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.